Great, thank you. Well, it's it's a, a, a great to be here. So I'm just going to unblur. I think that's uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, it's a real privilege to be with you tonight. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, so I'm Sarah Holmes and uh, I work at Liverpool Hope University uh, teaching early childhood and um, sorry, I'm just trying to find a better backdrop there. Teaching early childhood uh, in the School of Education. And part of my time I get to research um, anything and I, and I uh, really uh, spend all of that time looking at children's faith, churches, um, how churches can support families um, in faith and, and all those sorts of things. So particularly um, in the pandemic, I was looking at the church's response really uh, from a children's uh, and family perspective. Um, so that's uh, the, the main reason of what I'm talking about tonight. So I'm going to share uh, a PowerPoint uh, with you. Uh, we can send this around later. Um, I've made that uh, available. So I'm um, going to just share with you really some of the, the findings of um, things that I've been uh, involved with. Uh, I've put along the bottom some of the partners that I've been working with, done quite a few different projects looking at uh, some of these things. Um, so at the moment, I've, I've done, uh, sorry, I'm, I've done quite a lot with Liverpool Diocese, hence that's there, did that pre-COVID. Um, I was quite involved in um, baptism uh, work there um, with, with the wonderful team there. And um, then more recently, we've been looking at the Growing Faith Foundation and, and how we can support churches to, to navigate their way through perhaps um, adjusting and amending what they're doing. Um, and I've been kind of researching the impact of that sort of um, support and mentoring and, and training and input and so on. So, so that's uh, what I've been doing in Liverpool Diocese, but also um, I did some international work with uh, these organisations here, uh, uh, Script Union Canada and, and various other places. And then more recently, I've been working with these other organisations on the right hand side here. So um, care for the family and so on. So these findings and so on that I'm sharing tonight <clears throat> are sort of drawn from all of those different projects there. So feel free to type any questions in the chat as we go along. I may not see them immediately, but um, I'll respond to them later. Uh, so I'll make sure of that. So let's look there. I've got a picture of an x-ray there because I remember um, uh, quite early on in the pandemic when we were all sort of not sure what was going on and uh, everything was uh, all blowing up in the air and so on. And um, my colleague in the Netherlands said, well, the pandemic's just like an X-ray and it's showing things that were there all along, um, but perhaps we were less aware of. It's just kind of heightened them. And um, and I've, I've sort of stuck with this image really in terms of seeing you know actually we can see um perhaps in a bit of a more heightened way what's going on in churches in terms of uh what's going on in christian families and families outside of the church as well a bit more um in a heightened way because of the pandemic so um so this is uh, what i've been looking at so first of all i thought i'd i'd share with you these are some of what we uh, have been hearing um or what churches have been experiencing so it'd be very interesting to hear uh, as I say, feel free to type into the chat uh, any comments or questions on this. So this is what um, came out of a survey that we did uh, across the whole of the UK, uh, looking at um, sort of just uh, as once we'd finished with all the lockdowns and things were starting to unlock a little bit. Um, this is when we did the, the survey. And some churches were reporting improved relationships with families and an opportunity for greater focus on families. A very small number um, and some were reporting minimal change um, and um, also but there was a significant portion who were talking about negative impacts this was when we by the way we didn't say was it good or bad um, the pandemic for you we just said what's been your experience and we picked out um, what people were saying and so so a clear you know a, a substantial number this quarter of churches really talked about a significantly negative impact. Some of the others said things were not great, but this was the significant negative impact. And they were talking a lot about um, a lack of energy, vision. Now, uh, this thing of smaller teams, many people left um, teams that had existed before uh, the pandemic and so on. There was a lot of or a, a reduced engagement with families. Perhaps people were attending less often and perhaps fewer families were attending. So this was what we were sort of hearing. But then on a separate question, um, 
it was really clear 75% of churches said that what had been beneficial was relationships during uh, all of the turbulence of the pandemic. Um, and it was relationships amongst the church community um, that had been a good support. However, when we asked parents the same question, uh, less than half of them agreed. And in fact, a third of parents said that the local church they didn't feel had been supported. And so what, what I'm trying to do now is to unpack and to tease through and to see what's the reason for that difference and that sort of uh, clash, I guess, in terms of perhaps how things are being uh, defined. Perhaps there's different definitions of support, perhaps different approaches of support, um, perhaps differences in what is perceived as support. So, um, so really interesting to start to see that there's perhaps um, just a bit of a, a difference in what um, is being experienced there. So oh, I'll just move on to the next slide. There we go. Um, this was really interesting here. Um, when we uh, heard from church leaders, I should say, sorry, this wasn't only Church of England. This was um, open uh, to all churches in the UK. And um, 48% said that families now engage less than they did pre-pandemic, which is um, very striking. And, I, and I'm suspecting that many of you perhaps can resonate with that. Um, so 26% felt it was similar um, and 24% said that it had increased. And what, as we kind of looked into that further, we were finding people were still, uh, well, some families had completely disappeared and just not returned after the pandemic, but some um, were dipping in and out and attending much less frequently than they had done previously. Um, we asked um, about um, engagement with the local church. And again, we see there um, that churches are very clearly saying, 40% um, saying it hadn't helped with engagement. But interestingly, 30% didn't know, 30% uh, of the church leaders didn't know um, how, uh, how the pandemic had impacted the attendance or the engagement of families in their church which we found quite surprising really, um, that such a substantial number would say they didn't know. And so I, I kind of want to unpack tonight really with, with um, all of you um, wonderful people. Um, in each of your contexts to try and um, think about how might some of these things apply, but more, more so to think about how could you perhaps use some of these things to perhaps aid others in reflecting um, on your own context, because every single context is completely different and very unique. And so um, what I want to do is to share some ideas, some thoughts and questions that perhaps you can um, think about your own context and, um, and how it could um, perhaps do some quick and easy wins as such, and perhaps some things that may take a bit longer and a bit more time um, and so on. So thinking about what families were saying, um, about half of the families who responded to our survey said that their main source of support was family and Christian friends, very much those informal structures. Um, a small number said it was church. And so I think this thing of, th this question for us all to be pondering, and it's something I very much ponder in, in my own context um, at church as well, is what does support look like and what would families find helpful? And I think that um, it's a really tricky question because if you say to families, well, what do you want from us? Often they don't know and perhaps can't verbalize. Um, and so it's a tricky thing to, um, to navigate that. However, also at times they do um, explain some things. So I think what I'd encourage very much in um, these times where things are changing very much so, and uh, still quite up in the air, is to be listening to families, to be in dialogue, to be talking. Um, but I'll talk more about that in a few moments. Um, here we see uh, this, how can we better support families? And um, we asked about um, what did families find helpful uh, from churches? And 46% um, were saying that the relationships in church were the most beneficial thing during the pandemic. But it was very, very striking that only 2% of parents, um, sorry, I should have said, I, had, I think we had 209 parents um, who responded to this survey. The 2% said 
you know the little packs that um, became quite a, a thing to do in the pandemic, make these little packs of um, activity sheets and uh, worksheets and so on and, and take them around to people's houses. 2% of people said that they found those to be beneficial. And we were really surprised by this. Um, now, many people did go on to say, actually, it was the conversations that happened around those packs which were really beneficial but the actual packs themselves and the resource sheets and things like that were not particularly helpful. And, and I, the reason I'm sharing this is because I know the hours and hours and hours that many people spent and do spend making and generating all these different sheets and so on. Um, you know, I, when I think of how many hours of my life I've spent cutting, cutting out leaves or, uh, you know, making the little word searches or things like that. But actually, it seems to be relationships that people are finding much, much more beneficial. And I do think in these times where we're all sort of scratching our heads and wondering what uh, direction to go in, actually, if, if I think it's quite freeing to know that we don't need to spend hours and hours and hours every week generating all these uh, sheets or these leaflets or these things, because actually, certainly from the people we've spoken to and we've you know did uh, other interviews and spoken around and, and tested this out and very much people are saying the same thing it's the conversations it's the um relationships it's the support those things that are actually free <laughs> free of charge and um, they are um what people are finding most helpful rather than putting on lots and lots of other events, come on, come to this event, come to this service, here's another resource and all that kind of thing. So really spending time fostering those uh, relational connections within the congregation um, is, seems to be really what's um, so beneficial at this in this uh, season for helping families to feel more engaged um, and more cared for as part of that community of believers. We... Um, we did interviews as well um, as part of this with, with families and they were self-selecting. So we said, you know, would you like to do an interview and tell us a bit more about your experiences? And it was really quite sad. Um, I think it was a bit skewed because they contacted us because they felt a bit disgruntled with, perhaps with what had happened. But it was just sad to hear how many were saying, I don't know if I feel cared for by my church. I don't know if they notice that I hardly go now. And, and and that was really quite sad to hear and and I and again I you know it made me kind of really think about my own context you know just perhaps sending text messages you know oh you know it's the start of term we know it's a new school year we're praying for you this week or you know um we know it's your child's birthday or things like this or sending out little emails or um picking up the phone having a quick chat or popping around um these kind of things really, really are so meaningful and so beneficial and significant for families. Um, so I think that's something for us to kind of chew over um, and think about there. Um, I've already said this, relationships are helpful. And these are the kind of things that people were reporting when we sort of asked as an as a sort of open-ended question, what do you find helpful? And people were saying, actually, for the church to pray for my specific needs. There was a lot of this... Um, talk coming through in the surveys about I want to be seen as an individual not just oh there's all the families there or there the, the, there's the parents but actually for people to contact people on an individual basis and um you know what what are your specific needs you know and if somebody's ill but you know to really pray for that and to contact them again afterwards you know a week later two weeks later how's things going or if there's job difficulties those kind of things to really specifically um, pray for their family's needs um, particularly those with children with special needs really really benefit uh, appreciated um, prayer in, in a targeted way like that but also this sense of facilitating mutual parental support so people are saying it'd be really nice if they would just help somehow for us to get together and chat with other parents because after the service it's not easy to chat because we're always dashing around after our kids and that kind of thing so if, if if there's some kind of way where we could just facilitate us to get together from time to time for a coffee that would be really helpful providing resources to encourage faith conversations at home and this is a big area um which came through we'll talk a little bit more about that later but um this was something that people were saying after during the lockdowns um quite a few families were realizing that it actually they could 
talk to their children about faith. That there wasn't uh, something kind of dark and mysterious and unknown about it, but all it was was talking. And in a sense, that happened because there was no one else to talk to their children about faith, so they had to. And so many parents are saying, actually, I can do that, but it would be really helpful if the church would give me some kind of pointers or little resources. Um, in terms of ideas of how to talk about faith and so on and again we'll talk a little bit more about that later um people were talking about this culture um of what's expected so um it, it was we didn't ask leading questions at all you know, it was very open you know what do you want from your church and many people were saying i, I would really like there to be more of an understanding and awareness that we can do things at home with our children from a spiritual um, perspective it doesn't have to all be happening at church and I'd really like to have that much more of a dialogue happening there was a lot uh, of people talking about role modeling within congregations so many people were saying about the value of intergenerational congregations and how it's it's really great and that's what had been missed a lot um, when churches were not able to meet that sense that their children could see older um, members of the congregation different generations and they could be role models for them and and actually people found that really beneficial that mixing of the ages there um, and also there was some um, comments about it'd be really great if somehow churches would facilitate uh, like spiritual retreats for parents themselves because they perhaps found it tricky to access church um, due to their children so um, so that kind of thing so that's what people were saying um, they would find helpful from churches um, and I think I've said most of that. So dialogue with parents. Um, I think this is uh, kind of uh, something which is so, 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 so important. I'm someone who loves to chat. I can chat with anybody <laughs> um, and, uh, and so on. But um, I think what was coming through quite strongly was that parents, yes, they wanted to, someone to chat to, but they wanted someone to chat to about faith. And um, people were sometimes saying, or oh, sometimes, uh, you know, we get support from church in a um, supportive uh, kind of uh, emotional way, perhaps, or in a practical way. But actually, we don't perhaps get that conversation about faith, uh, that spiritual support informally. And so people were saying this sense of dialogue um, with the church would be really, really beneficial. Um, now, it's interesting that um, about half of the church leaders didn't know um how the pandemic had impacted uh, I, I mentioned this earlier as well but also um a quarter didn't know if the families felt supported um, and so i think part of that is if we can try and discuss that and have a dialogue amongst our congregations you know do you feel supported how has the pandemic um impacted you what does it feel like now that schools are back to normal and so on and so on seems great how is that from a faith perspective how is this going how's that but to really have a conversation in an open way with families people are saying that would be really really beneficial um and this was something that um people were saying here some churches had responded by providing training for parents um and had sent many 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 emails or sheets of paper and so on signposting resources but people often felt that was a bit overwhelming and would prefer a much more targeted and specific support from the local church. And so this is why I've done quite a bit of work with these organizations, um, Care for the Family and Parenting for Faith particularly, because they have so many resources there and we don't need to create these things, they're already there. So if we can signpost um, families to those organizations or even perhaps if we just spend time looking on the, the websites of those organizations and finding, oh, there's two or three really good web pages here. And then having those in our mind so that if somebody says, oh, you know, um, I'm finding it really difficult because my child doesn't want to go to church or because my child's talking about, you know, science and how it connects with faith or something. We can say, oh, actually, there's a really good um, page on this parenting faith, you know, or whatever. And to have those in our mind so that we can help people by targeting support in that way um, though as part of dialogue I think would be really so many of these things these dialogues these signposting and so on again it's it's low cost um, or no cost which is great so I think yep yeah, there we go um I thought we'd spend a bit of time discussing this now 
um, some of these things here. So I guess the big question is, does this kind of resonate with your context? Um, so uh, that first question, do you think the churches you're connected with, uh, what do you think about how families might feel supported spiritually? Um, are they supported and how can you see that? How do you know that they are supported um, spiritually? And what's the result of that? And I think it'd be really interesting in the break to talk about this um, and to hear ideas from other places, um, you know, how are people feeling supported? Um, because then we can, you know, it's good to, to get ideas and spark thoughts and so on. Also thinking about how can we encourage and inspire the church to focus more intentionally on families and so on there. Um, and what are your thoughts about this, this sense of, um, where, where I've talked about relationships being really important and dialogue being really important and perhaps less important than generating lots and lots of uh, activity sheets or uh, services, events, that kind of thing. Very good. Super. Well, welcome back, everybody, into our back into this uh, room. I always find it quite exciting flying through space into the breakout room, but welcome back. So it'd be really interesting, perhaps, if people um, could uh, perhaps type into the chat any um, uh, any things that that came out of those um, conversations you were having, particularly thinking about um, how were people being supported spiritually and how you could see that and, and what did seem to be um, beneficial and helpful and so on. And those sort of good news stories, I guess, it'd be really helpful to share those. So feel free to type those into the chat. Um, and also interesting to, um, to hear your thoughts about this, this balance of um, experience and uh, sort of uh, relational things versus the resources um there in terms of um you know i mentioned this statistic about you know not many families found those bags particularly helpful um and yet it was something we spent so much time on and i think there's that i think it was probably at a time when people were desperate to do something and it felt like something tangible that we could do um there so um so, so it's sort of people perhaps got on 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 the bandwagon as such and did that but um actually you know just as, as I was saying just having those conversations and and having that sense of belonging is what people um really were saying they appreciated one of the things I was just um saying there uh, just before we started was that um I have four children sorry I didn't uh, say that already and when I attend church it's very stressful very difficult um my kids are pretty well behaved um got a three-year-old and then three who are a bit older they're, they're, they're very well behaved really but still it's quite hard you know um trying to uh, trying to keep the three-year-old in some kind of um uh, place but also you know the older ones want to go off and do their thing or, or you know perhaps they do, do they want to leave early or they want to go and do this one is that and it's and it is quite stressful and difficult being there and this is what perhaps some people were saying is that um upon uh returning to church after the closures um it felt quite difficult because it's so stressful being there and and often people didn't feel the church understood that or um or really uh, grasped how difficult it was uh, in some cases people were saying oh you know i was told to keep my kids quiet and that kind of thing and i just can't do that you know and um, this sort of thing and so this is what i'm talking about in terms of a dialogue is that genuine discussion with families how do you find it coming to church is it is it hard is there something we can do to make it better if we keep you, you know, a seat here at the side, does that help you? Or, you know, do you want us to get you a, a drink of water? Or I don't know, just some things to have a conversation like that about how we can help um, in a very practical way is in a spiritual way as well, like I was talking about praying and so on. So some people have typed into the chat. Uh, messy church within the parish or the deanery has always been really helpful to connect with families. And I think one of the, uh, thank you for everyone who's typed in the chat, by the way, one of the... Um, real benefits of messy church is that relational side i think that there is space 
and time to have those conversations and to it's kind of almost um built into the the fabric of it that it is a relational conversational sort of time so i think that's one of the really great benefits of it and there is that sense of belonging which is what families um you know we're, we're hearing of really craving and wanting um oh it's just slightly gone up um uh uh, forget the websites talk to people yeah yeah so um talking and actually we we've had a slight um telling off today in, in work I work in a university and we've been told stop using uh zoom for all your meetings walk down the corridor you know uh, stop emailing each other but go and talk and in a way we've sort of forgotten that because of uh, all these restrictions that have been going on but we can now we can now talk so you know let's try and reclaim that particularly within the within, the, within our churches Alternative forms of worship, more attractive than traditional forms, people are saying there. And um, we also had a great idea mentioned about teachers and others meeting to pray. Yep. And again, there's some really great stories um, we've heard about that. Uh, and actually where, where the likes of Zoom has been beneficial because teachers from different schools could perhaps connect together one lunchtime and have a prayer um, time together or um, churches are... Um, contacting schools and saying you know we're praying for you this week is there anything you'd like and over and keeping doing that um repeatedly and um and schools are starting to say actually there is this this thing could you pray for us with this and and it's opening up a dialogue with the school so absolutely prayer and and schools really great um not sure how useful the word support is in this together yeah yep yeah, yep yeah. it's yeah absolutely absolutely really good point um, and and I'll, I'll talk about that soon about partnership and um absolutely yeah and um really good point there whatsapp groups yeah really good um sometimes i hate whatsapp groups because they they ping constantly but some but often they're so good at helping people feel connected um so that's really good and uh, and those sort of networks great um during the pandemic um yeah absolutely yeah great yeah so it is it is friend friendliness and um relationships that is is seemingly what attracts people and um, people want to feel um that sense of belonging that sense of togetherness um they're uh exacerbated by okay yeah generational challenges huge efforts to keep in touch yeah yeah, it's interesting this returning um, to to what we kind of knew before, um, and I think that's a comfort thing. Um, I was in a meeting today. We we're talking about that. This thing that people said, "Oh, let's change everything. We've got the opportunity," but then a lot of people are returning back to what we had previously um, as a kind of uh, perhaps uh, uh, something we know about. Um, great. So lots of ideas there. Eating and praying together. Yeah. And in fact, one one um, one really simple idea. Um, I, I'll try and put the link in a moment. Um, care for the family, the kitchen table project. Do something called the. Um, I should have brought the leaflet here. Um, the, the scrumptious faith filled feast, and you can actually get these things free of charge. I got some uh, the other day for myself. Uh, look online. It's like um, when you go to a restaurant. Um, uh, if you if you have kids. They give you like a little table mat with activities on and so on um, and to kind of keep your kids busy while you're eating. But they've they've made these um, table mat type things with activities on all about faith. And so um, it's a really simple way um, to run an event for families. What you're saying there about eating, praying together. Actually, you can just get these um, uh, packs delivered from Care for the Family free of charge. Don't even charge postage. <laughs> and um and give those out at the door, have some kind of food together. And it's a really easy way to have families and have some kind of light conversation about faith. And you could actually then tag on some kind of service if you wanted to, or you could just have it like that. Um, so really great idea about eating um, and praying together. Yeah. Um, connections with schools. Yeah, great. Super. So loads of things there. Um, really helpful. Thank you. Great. Super. Yeah. Different ideas, things about informal service and so on. Great. Right. I'll stop reading the chat for now, but we'll have a look later. Thanks so much for sharing those um, those thoughts. That's really, really helpful. Um, really interesting. So just going to um, share the PowerPoint again. So just to carry on then. Um, 
here we go. Um, there we are. Here we have some things about um, experiences of family. So we've kind of thought of um, perhaps a little bit from the church perspective, but this was in terms of kind of the feelings um, that families were reporting. And again, we didn't ask, um, you know, happy, sad or whatever. We, we did it as open-ended sort of questions. And, and these words were very much coming through about um, significant numbers of families. So, so just to clarify, I think somebody had asked um, how we selected those um, participants in the survey. Somebody typed this to me in the chat. Um, well, um, it was an open invitation. We sent the survey invitation out through all sorts of networks, various different church networks, you know, uh, all sorts of um, things through organisations, all sorts of Facebook groups, which um, uh, Christian families are on and those sorts of things. And um, so we knew that the people who replied were probably the slightly more um, connected families because they were probably more likely to reply to the survey. But even of those families, 66% um, of them were saying they felt quite withdrawn, quite disconnected from church. But there were some really exciting um, things that we could see because 42% said that even though they felt a little bit disconnected from church, it had actually increased and um, uh, enriched um, their, um, their, their, their connections with church. And... Uh, Sorry, that's in terms of their faith at home. That should be, sorry, I've said that wrong. To 42%, it had increased and enriched their faith at home that they were doing. 10% um, um, said increased discipleship in the home. So, so they're very similar. 32% uh, said their spiritual activity at home had decreased. But it was really exciting for us to see this, that, that about half of the people were saying, actually, even though we're a little bit disconnected with church, we are able to do so much more at home. We're actually feeling much more spiritually involved and more spiritually um, active in terms of our family faith at home. And this was so exciting um, to hear about this. So I put some of the comments there at the bottom that people were saying, um, we ha we're having now more intentional children's worship at home. Faith's now part of our everyday life. We talk about it. Um, this is what people are saying. We're having some spiritual conversations in our home now. And so this was really exciting. And I think this is a, a, another area that, again, not with particularly taking a, a big amount of time um, or, or money, we, we can perhaps invest into in, um, in our churches. So um, th this was really uh, interesting. 96% of these parents said that they regularly discuss faith together in their home and they encourage their child's faith journey, which is so exciting. Uh, as I say, this was um, perhaps a slightly more engaged sample of people, but really exciting to see such high statistics there. And, and so many of them wanting to instill Christian habits, beliefs and practices in their child. And so I think this is perhaps for us, you know, um, very much as part of my kind of ministry life. I've always looked, you know, where is God working? Where is there um, God's, God's activity happening? And if we see actually... For many families, they're having all these really great conversations at home and discussing um, these things. They're wanting to instill habits in their children. Then let's talk about those as, as churches. Let's say, well, you know, how is it going? How can we help with that? Perhaps um, just giving a few little pointers and encouragement in that will actually be quite impactful on the, the faith of um, the, the onward generations. Um, so. We said to churches, what do you think Christian parents are wanting at the moment? And this is what people were saying. Churches were thinking they wanted reconnection with church, which seemed to match up with um, what parents were saying. But also they wanted support. They wanted encouragement to be valued and listened to. And also 26% um, saying they wanted support in growing faith in the home. But it was really interesting this. So I, I think this is a pretty accurate um, thing when we match that up with what parents were saying. But it was so interesting, this, this final point here, that um, we had a quarter of the church is saying, we think parents are wanting support for faith uh, at home, discussing faith at home with their children. But then when we looked through to say, what are, what are these people doing? They weren't particularly doing that. So I think this is particularly, you know, from a deanery sort of perspective, Perhaps this is an area we can support 
um, support churches and, and, and local uh, settings with in terms of how can we try to um, help families, um, you know, in terms of faith in the home and conversations and so on. Because actually the impact that that could have um, on the, the faith life and, and uh, you know, helping children and young people to, to continue to be active in faith is really quite marked. Now, this is an interesting slide, though, so, um, and we, we asked this question. Um, I did some multinational research and also some UK research, and it just showed ex pretty much exactly the same um, finding, which is really, really strongly that both churches and parents think it should be a partnership, which um, going back to that comment that somebody had put in the chat, it shouldn't just be about support, but it should be that togetherness. Um, and this was showing that so, so clearly, so strongly. Um, so the, the the pie chart at the top there, um, the, that um, people are saying the church should not be the primary um, nurturer of faith, of a child's faith, um, but actually instead they should be supporting parents, reinforcing um, the nurture that parents are doing and available for advice if needed. Uh, and then similarly in the UK, again, the, the stats are the similar at the bottom. 91% of parents do not want the church to be the sole provider of their child's spiritual support. Um, and, and church leaders agreed with this. They didn't think they should be the sole um, providers um, there. And parents wanting to uh, work in this sense of partnership, church leaders wanting to work in a partnership. So this is really exciting because it shows that we're all on the same page and uh, feeling this same thing. And so I guess my question then is, how does that translate into the ethos of our churches and, um, and the activity of our churches and the kind of the, the messages that we're giving? Um, because then when we, you know, looked at it, it didn't seem that that particularly matched up with what was actually happening. Um, and here we see, um, so this is a statistic here from Barna, which is an American uh, piece of research. Um, so, y y you know, we could say it applies only America, but I think it's probably um, similar here. Um, they, were say, they found that 72% of church engaged parents were more likely to rely on the church um, for the faith development of their children than to be particularly um, proactive themselves and also this thing that's 30 30 percent only 30 percent sorry of the responses I went through and really analyzed and looked at them what are people saying about partnership and, and being together and there's there's not much um, talk of that in the uh, not much evidence of that in the surveys and the, the interviews and so on and so I think this is, again, something, you know, from a sort of a deanery's perspective as we're sort of musing over um, how we can support churches, resource churches and uh, different contexts and so on to think about this. You know, we all seem to agree it should be a partnership, but parents don't seem to always be um, taking that on. They're perhaps seeming a bit ill-equipped, lacking confidence and so on. So um, so wanted to kind of, you know, just... Uh, muse over really how we could um help with that um and again these these organizations you know i don't think we need to be reinventing the wheel these organizations that i've been working with got so many ideas so i'll make sure we distribute that um later but um i think it's probably time now for a bit of a comfort break um so i thought perhaps it'd be good to ponder some of these questions um i think what we take about five or ten minutes tim i can't remember what um what, yeah, we can do five minutes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a five minutes. Yeah. So feel free to um, pop off and uh, uh, fill your, your coffee cup, whatever, but perhaps muse these questions over whilst you're doing so. How can we think about this culture of our churches um, and try and change that to be more partnership with parents? And how can deaneries signpost uh, this sort of support in a sort of tailored sort of way? So I'll leave you with those questions. Um, to ponder feel free to type in the chat if you already can think of something you want to um, and we'll we'll join back together in about five minutes thank That's you nice. it's 20 past now so we'll come back together at 25 past eight
Okay, I make it uh, eight twenty-five, Sarah. If you'd like to pick up where we were left off. Yes, great. Thank you. I never quite know if clocks match up and all that kind of thing. So thanks for keeping an eye. That's good. Very good. Great. So I think this this question is a really tricky one. You know how to change the ethos and the culture because it's so deeply ingrained and and these patterns are um, so much. You know where we've come to. Uh, in time and so on. But um, but I think it is a, a really key question for us, uh, you know, as, as the church in this time that we're living in is how can we uh, try and create more of a sense of being in partnership? And I think, um, you know, as, as, as I said earlier, you know, this sense of dialogue, just talking, just chatting. And um, I've got this sheet, which we can send around later. And just some little discussion prompts or some little ideas of things, you know, perhaps um, how they could be uh, conversation starters after the service or perhaps, you know, to phone somebody up or at the toddler group or um, even, you know, ways that we could um, have uh, conversations or talk about things during the service or to have some of these conversations at PCC level. Um, you know, perhaps, you know, thinking from a kind of deanery's perspective, you know, um, where are the conversations happening where we can just talk about this, you know, and chat together and say, how can we, in our context that we're working in, make parents feel more um, empowered, more um, more listened to and more valued? Um, I remember uh, when the schools closed um, and everything went all a bit crazy and we were getting sent home all of these sheets about, you know, how to do maths, how to do English, all, all these things for, for my kids to do. And um, and I kind of thought, well, actually, the, for one of my children particularly, it wasn't the right sort of thing. And um, and actually, I knew that she struggled particularly with certain aspects of maths, for example. And, and I thought, well, why, when she's struggling with those fundamental things, am I going off teaching her these other things? She's not quite ready for that yet. But then other things were too easy. And I, I knew my child better at that moment in time than the teachers who were sort of sitting remotely in a classroom. And, and I think we often do that a little bit inadvertently as churches. We give off this impression that um, we know what all kids need spiritually, you know, and um, we don't need to listen to, to parents to where they're at. But I think actually to um, to have those conversations and to say, you know, oh, you know, I, I, you know, I've been really thinking recently, you know, how do you know kids who are you know six get on with praying? You know, how how do you find it in your house? Do your kids like praying, or what helps them to pray? And and to to do it from that perspective of the fact that we want to learn from those parents, we want to hear genuinely what's what um what ideas they want to share, but also you know what are some of the challenges? So. Um, you know, I see somebody put there in the ch the chat something about sport. You know, and that that tension of, um, you know, uh, if children wanting to do particular sports on a Sunday, and so if we're if we're genuinely listening to that and we're hearing that coming over many many times, what can we do about that then? Um, you know, could we could we perhaps um, you know do things at a different time, provide opportunities a different way? Um, could we encourage parents how they can talk in the home about faith, even if they can't come along to services that we're doing? And so it's that sense of really listening and really talking. I think we'll start to slowly, slowly, slowly change the culture and so on. Uh, let's just see. Has anybody put anything in the chat? Um, yeah. Yeah. So more there about um, kids choosing, not worrying about the answers. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. That's super great. Thanks. Really interesting. So I'm just going to oops, um, move on now to, to like a final segment um, to talk a bit about vision. And this is uh, one of the things I think that um, uh, got picked up in the Church Times. I think this was one of the, the things that came out of our research um, about vision. And um, oh, my click has gone. There we go. Um, and in terms of strategy and vision and, and what what a church is doing in this sort of season and what can we do what do we hope to do and so on I already said at the beginning was that the sense of um, feeling a little bit um, jaded we're all exhausted it's all really difficult um, the numbers are low the numbers of teams are low all that kind of thing um, but really really interesting when we said to churches um, 
what's what's your sort of strategy what's your sort of vision what's your thoughts about next steps that you want to be doing and it was so striking that 99 percent of those who'd responded said they didn't have anything written down or didn't have any kind of formal um, strategy or plan uh, again i would say the, the probably the people who tend to do surveys are probably a bit more engaged and a bit more thinking about these things the fact that even of those um, this statistic so high was really, really striking. So people sometimes said things like, well, we have uh, a vision for the church and that includes children or something. So perhaps there was that. But um, this was, you know, did people have something deliberately, um, not necessarily separate, but did they have a, a plan for what they wanted to do? Um, uh, in that sense? And so some of the challenges there uh, as part of that. Um, the responses to the question often were a little bit confused, didn't quite know what we meant by that. Um, in terms of some people were just saying, well, we run a Sunday school or, you know, what's what's your vision? Well, we do messy church. Um, or, and so, so there's a sense of if we do an activity, that's it done. We don't perhaps need to think about what we're aiming to do or what what's our plan, what's our next steps. Um, sort of thing, which was kind of really interesting reading that into the thing. Um, and th this sense very much number three there, strategies are often determined not by the children's or family ministry leaders, but by the senior levels of church leadership. So we were we were hearing this coming through uh, in, in the research that, well, the church leadership haven't put anything in there about um, children. So, you know, it, it's not there. You know, we didn't have an input or something like that. And again, I think, you know, from a deanery sort of perspective, this is something that, you know, if we can start to have these conversations and say, oh, you know, how could we help you to think about, uh, you know, it doesn't need to be a very advanced, um, particularly detailed sort of strategy, but what what are you aiming for? And what are the sort of next step, one step, and perhaps the next step after that? What, what's the kind of sequence to get there, um, the progression um, that you're sort of thinking of? Um, and so, uh, you, you know, I think, again, this is something that, you know, if we can start to have these conversations, it will be really valuable. Um, children are often not um, consulted or included um, in, in deciding these as well. That was very clear. And then in terms of restrictions of this sort of thing of vision and strategy, um, as I've already been talking about, what are the spiritual needs of families in our context? So, um, uh, you know, I've done quite a lot of work with churches about this now and trying to sort of look at what is helpful to help churches to set vision and strategy. And it just seems that often we, we, we it's easier perhaps to skip that step of listening to people in our context and rather to say, well, now I did hear of a church down the road that was doing a really effective message church, so we'll do that. And that's our, our activity done. But it might be that in your context, that's not as appropriate because perhaps, I don't know, perhaps people don't like that sort of thing. Now, I'm not I'm not saying, you, you know, that, but we, we just don't know. Perhaps people are particularly sporty in your setting and that would suit really well. Or perhaps um, a real outdoors session might suit. Or perhaps people want quite a reflective service. Um, so, so actually listening to what's going on first and then thinking what therefore do we need um, is really key. Perhaps it is that thing of, well, actually, everybody's rushing off to go to football um, lessons on a Sunday at 10.30. So could you do something for families at 8.30, for example? Um, you know, I know of quite a few churches that are doing that sort of things. Just a half hour service, but particularly for families, make it really easy to access, pop in for half an hour, 45 minutes maybe, and then they can go off and do their um, things then. You know, are, are there things like that if we listen to the needs of the families before we um, start off on our planning? But also, often we're so restricted, we restrict ourselves by what we know. So this thing about, um, you know, 10.30 on a Sunday, um, you know, we don't have to be doing things at that time. You know, maybe it is, you know, early, perhaps it is at five o'clock on a Sunday when people have done all these activities. And, um, you know, I've heard of churches who serve tea um at, uh, at five o'clock and have some sort of service around that um and that's really effective as well other people do things after school um perhaps for families one night a week and that works really well but but again it very much depends on the context because if in your context 
um, there's a lot of working families, then evenings um, aren't um, aren't as good. But perhaps if people want children to go to things, that, that would be good uh, in an evening. So really important to be listening to what um, what's really going on in your context. Uh, thinking then about the format, um, the people, the resources, who have we got? And perhaps, um, you know, if there isn't a huge team, to be thinking then a bit, well, what who do we have? And, and creating something from that. So um, I had a meeting last night um, and, and we were trying to, to, to help um, a church who was saying, we hardly have anybody on our kids team, what should we do and so on. And, and actually what we're doing is looking at doing something completely different. So still actually during the service on a Sunday, but um, for example, there's somebody who's really art and quite an artist really, um, but would never volunteer to join the kids team. Um, but he he's uh, quite you know very friendly and very arty, and he'd love to come along and do some art with the kids. So we're getting him to come along. Um, we've just we're going to try and see if we can do that once a month for him to come along and and show the kids and get the kids and do this kind of thing and he, and ask him to talk about his faith while he's doing it. We're not going to have a whole great big programme like we normally would, just that quite a simple agenda. Um, similarly, we've got a couple of blokes in the church who are um, really into outdoors and, you know, lighting fires and building dens, all that kind of thing. And so, again, they just would not want to join our kids team, but, um, you know, we're going to ask them to come along um, sometimes and to do that and to share their faith and some of their story there. Equally, a scientist that we have, again. Um, and so so we're trying to think, who are the people that we have and how can we use those people to um, to be kind of role models for the kids rather than um, having to, you know, say, you have to come and do this uh, set uh, programme every single week. So who are the people you've got? What have you got? What are the resources um, there? Um, often we, we predetermine our aims. Perhaps our aims are that we just want to increase the Sunday morning numbers. But actually, and, and this is a, a shift in my mindset that I'm having to really consciously make, is that um, it's more important to me that many, many children and young people are getting closer to Jesus and, and developing their own faith, their own independent faith. Um, and, and feeling stronger in faith, that's way more important to me than it is to, you know, have 100% uh, attendance for four weeks in a row type of thing at church. And so it's back to this thing of what, how can we use faith in the home to sort of support people uh, in that way? Um, needing a team, I've talked a bit about that, and using programmes, ideas and resources. Again, often we just pick these up. And I mean, I've been uh, I've done this myself in the past. I think, well, this is a nice cover on this book. We'll use that resource. But I don't actually look at it and say, does this actually meet the needs? Is this uh, helping um, with the aims uh, that we're wanting? Is this part of our vision um, there? So really kind of um, starting, with what's your aims? Who are the people that are there? And uh, I think if we, uh, you know, can those of us in various roles um, of sort of leadership and so on can try and help churches and contexts to think these questions through, I think it will make the work that's happening um, much more effective. So I see there's some things um, in the chat there, some ideas. So I'll have a look at those in a moment. But I think we've just got time to have a five minute breakout room um, uh, there. So um, I, pretty much the question is, you know, have you got any um, good examples, good news stories of this kind of thing? And, you know, how can deaneries really be um, supporting uh, churches to develop those um, strategies, those plans, thinking what their aims are and, that, and, and where can we see God working. Great, I think everybody's back now from the breakout rooms. Hopefully you found those conversations helpful. Um, it's all very well me uh, going on about these things, but it's so 
beneficial hearing others talk and bouncing ideas off one another and hearing different things that are working well also hearing each other's challenges that can that can be helpful as well so and um, so it'd be really really great to um have some kind of feedback um from that again any um <clears throat> any things that are working well how we can uh you know work with churches to really help ask these questions about changing the culture about um you know this sense of working in partnership but also this thing of uh how do we set uh, a strategy or an aim or, or what's our plan sort of thing so do type those in the chat that'd be really great just while you're doing that um i'm just looking up the uh, previous things people have said um in terms of safeguarding uh, mary said that there and absolutely you know um this is so so key and um you know again at you know, last night I was having this very conversation um, about safeguarding. And, um, you know, the fact is we do need to keep our, our, our children and young people safe. And um, and so, uh, you know, I I do, you know, ask people to, I'm, I'm the safeguarding lead in, in my context. And I do, um, you know, ask people to, to, uh, to do a DBS check. Often I find actually a lot of people now have, a DBS check for different contexts and perhaps hopefully have the update service and then it's actually quite easy to do that. Um, people who are new to our church, um, I do, uh, we, we have a policy we would take references as well from a previous context um, and so uh, I suppose if it's people who've been in the church a long long time and we know them well then we can easily arrange references within the church, but I think absolutely we need to we need to to be doing that. Um, the other thing is, um, as well, you can have visitors into a setting. I, I, you know, I think so. Uh, again, within our policy, we would do this. So, so long as there are two uh, or the appropriate number of uh, adults there uh, supervising the children, and if we have a visitor in who isn't vetted. They, you know, we'd have parameters around that. So they wouldn't be on their own with children. They wouldn't take the children to the toilet um, and those sorts of things. Um, so we could have visitors um, coming in that way um, if, if people, um, you know, are not vetted and so on. So um, they're just some thoughts about safeguarding. Um, do we want to lead this into a, a question and answer time? Would that, uh, as part of this, John, or how, how do you think that would be helpful? Yeah, I think it would actually. I mean, there are one or two interesting ones there. Whether Adrian Greenwood could give us an idea about what Bubble Church is about, that'd be an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Martin, are you going to uh, chair this bit? Happy to do that. Yes, you want to put something in your chat room uh, and I'll, um, I'll pick people out to, to get some questions. There's something already coming in now. Um... Uh, Adrian speaking. Um... I don't know too much about bubble church, but it involves puppets uh, and people sitting. The bubble that they, is, is an area that they sit within. Uh, so you need an open plan church. Um, but I think it's well publicized and well advertised on uh, the Ascension Vallum. Um, my fellow Southerkin person, um, Bex Chapman, may be able to say a bit more putting you on the spot, Bex. Uh, yeah, so it, it is based at Ascension Church Ballam. Um, interestingly, it was started during COVID, so it involves um, involves basically sort of socially distanced church. So the kids literally go and sit on little carpets, I think, at Ascension that, that look like bubbles, which is quite fun. So you do church as a family unit, but it's led from the front. Um, it's quite short. As Adrian said, puppets feature quite strongly. Um, and they've seen some really great results, so much so that I believe Southwark's been given £250,000 to roll it out over five more congregations over the next couple of years, I think, if that helps. But yeah, Adrian's right, there's lots about it online and there's a couple of links now in the chat if anyone wants to have a look. Um, no, that's, that's a good question here, come from Christine McMullen uh, about that. I wonder whether, Christine, would you like to come in? Or so you see that in the chat room about the areas where families are struggling emotionally. Uh, thank you. Um, we just do find it very difficult that the concept of, of families with mothers and fathers and children who are sitting at tables for meals every day um, isn't part of how 
that many people in this area live. Um, and the church has not really kept up and we've now got to find new ways of moving in um, and, and really sharing ourselves and our faith with them. But um, um, it, uh, I, I would welcome any ideas. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really, really absolutely valid point. And I think that uh, you, you're right, um, Christine, we do perhaps have a perception of who we are, you know, catering for. And again, it's very much, again, this dialogue thing, you know, chatting and mm -hmm. saying, you know, what would you find helpful? Would you find it helpful to, along, you know, have a meal together, as, you know, and, and, and so on, uh, mm -hmm. you know, at church to have a meal. And actually for some people um, that, you know, to have a nutritious, uh, lovely warm meal cooked for their family, you know, and lots of family sitting together type thing. Actually, that can be so, so impactful. Um, mm. But but I think as well, you know, thinking what would faith at home look like for those people, you know? And again, you know, we can't, um, you know, say, well, everybody's going to be sitting around the table eating dinner or whatever. Um, you know, and eat, you know, for many families, that's just not a reality uh, for so many reasons. Um, so so what could that look like? And, and I think it's chatting that together, you know, and saying, well, do you ever have times where, you know, perhaps you're walking to school or something um, and you could just have a chat about along the way about um, about God or, you know, uh, 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 pray together on the way. You know, I do that with my kids um, while we're traveling to school and, um, you know, or, or, you know, what are some of the real questions that your kids are asking or saying about God and, and, and hearing that and then using that to inform what we do. Um, and uh, and I think we'll be surprised perhaps by some of the simple things that will make a big difference. Mm. But by doing them, you know, uh, the impact is quite big. And even <laughs> even simple things like praying for people and and going back, you know, and saying, you know, in it th three weeks time, how how is you know that going? How is financially? How how are things? You know, and, and going back two months time, you know, and showing the consistency that you know as a people um of christ that we care and we're there you know we are praying consistently things like that i think really um have so much more power than we perhaps realize yeah thank you do put um uh, questions in the chat room if you'd like to because i am while we've got this question asked in session um sarah will, will be uh, uh, happy to answer some more questions the comment there comes from Carol Bates about the open, uh, um, open the book being a good way forward, a bit of relationship. Does anybody want to say anything about that, um, Sarah? Open the book. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm not particularly um, knowledgeable about that, to be honest. But um, I think in terms of schools um, and connections with schools, particularly you know faith schools, it's absolutely something that we should be developing as churches. I think and. Um, I think things have changed so perhaps there was a time when schools really wanted input in terms of assemblies or RE lessons and so on perhaps that's less so now um, but what what I'm really hearing is this sense of chaplaincy or schools coming alongside uh, churches sorry churches coming alongside schools in a relational way providing that sort of support and that can then flow out into things like open the book and and it's those again. It's relationships speaking to your school. What what do they want? What is helpful? Um, again, so so impactful. And it, again, you know, in terms of you know the, the growing faith uh, foundation, you know, this sense of uh, connecting between the three, you know, school, church, and home, um, is so so uh, impactful in terms of faith, um, nurturing faith for children. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. I think there, there aren't any other questions coming forward. Oh, so maybe. Um... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you can make a difference. Yeah. And I think this is the thing, isn't it? Sometimes we're tempted to think, oh, you know, because we, we don't have a team, we can't do anything. Or, you know, we only have two children, we can't do anything. Um, but actually, it's just thinking, well, uh, what could we have? With what we, we, you know, what what have we got? And what can we do? There's little steps moving forward, 
And I think this thing of um, empowering parents and equipping parents um, and uh, having those conversations actually is way more impactful than what we what we think. Actually, just um, something I hadn't mentioned yet, um, doing a research project from January um, onwards, um, working with the Growing Faith Foundation, they're funding it, um, about empowering parents. And we're looking for, I think it's about 15 churches who want to join uh, this research project. Um, and basically, they need to be churches who want to deliberately empower parents in their context. And we'll provide sort of some uh, training, some discussion ideas and, and activities and resources and all this kind of thing to help you as a church to do that. Um, and then we'll sort of track through and observe and, and speak to people, you know, what's the impact of that? Because um, we have this hunch that if we can empower parents in this way, it will be quite impactful. So if that's something that interests you in your context, do get in touch with me um, and, and uh, you know, we can we can chat about that. Yeah. Julie made a good point, a good point there about uh, the key stage three drop off. Do you want to, to, to speak to that, Sarah? Uh, it's more from a youth point of view. We are struggling with key stage three drop off. Um, what's that in terms of? Do you know? Um, Is that, I, I'm wondering if that's the, um, Julie, I want to pick up on that. Yeah, um, we've since going back uh, after pandemic we the children's church is slowly growing we've been doing messy church once a month and we now have quite a lot of um, families coming regularly but I can't get my youth group I can't get the key stage one sort of people through the door and just wondered if there was any <laughs> magic trick that <laughs> might so help. This is, yeah so this is to sort of encourage the young people to be attending more is that yeah 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 um I think again that one of the biggest things that people of that age want is this thing of belonging again you know it's that and and um uh, you know, it, it's lovely to see um, a few young people together who just really click. But the hard thing is if that you don't have that, you know, and if you don't have that sense of cohesion, then it's hard to um, to connect. But um, one thing I've heard of people doing is um, having perhaps sort of uh, like a buddy sort of system. Again, you know, we need to think of safeguarding, of course. But, you know, even just um, meeting up with uh, a young one of the young people or a couple of the young people and saying, oh, should we go and, you know, get get an ice cream or something, go for a quick walk and have a chat um, and try and build relationships that way. Um, and um, slowly over time, you know, to be sort of increasing that. And, um, you know, and I think as those relationships develop, then, then they're more likely to want to be there, but also perhaps to ask them why they're not coming. Um, you know, what is the reason? Uh, maybe it's because they don't want to get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> maybe it's because um, they don't like whatever is happening. Uh, you know, what's the reason, and what would they, what would they come to? You know, so perhaps they would come to, I don't know. So, uh, well, you know, let, let's find out. But um, you know, perhaps people want to sort of sit, sit round and have a chill out time with with a bag of crisps or something whereas they don't want to jump around doing loads of action songs or you know you know so I think you know if people aren't coming and, and it's a struggle we need to just ask them why and and talk about what what do they like doing and perhaps they don't know what they'd like to do at church but we could find out what do they like doing in the rest of their lives you know what do they like about school what do they like about the you know netball club they go to or the um, you know, uh, Minecraft club, or what is it that they're doing, and how can we then use that to inform um, the, the things that we're doing as well? So um, that would be my sort of thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, folks just put about playing football for choir practice. Um, we're just doing a musical with Oliver and, and got 60 odd kids in the church involved in it. So, all sorts of things which are just sound not necessarily churchy things, but are ways in which you draw people to all the actors into buildings and uh, 
make me feel that. So thank you very much indeed. And, and ladies and gentlemen, everyone for your comments. It is about nine o'clock. Uh, and I promise to be a good boy. Make sure I keep timings up together. So we would normally come there. So, is there anything else you want to say before we um, uh, before we, 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 we sort of draw ourselves to a close? Um, no, just to encourage people. You know, I think um, actually anything that people do to uh, reach out to kids and young people and families, any minutes of time that people give is just impactful in some way so just to encourage people that even tiny tiny bits that you can do is really impactful um, for the kingdom so well done and keep on and keep it on with what you're doing yeah